We're back now here on Reliable Sources. I'm Brian Stelter, and we're talking about all of the fallout from the Ford Kavanaugh hearing. I'm joined now by Katie Couric. Uh, she needs no introduction, uh, but of course she comes from the Today Show, from CBS, from Yahoo. Uh, she's now the co-host of the Katie Couric podcast, uh, and you have a really interesting uh, new pod about your Sarah Palin interview that I want to ask you about. But but first, your reactions to this week. Uh, wow. Well, what an incredible week. What an <laughs> I find myself still week. trying to process it. What yeah. a confusing week. I think I agree with a lot of things that Jessica said, that I think, Brian, that our understanding of sexual violence against women and the trauma, the lifelong trauma that ensues, is still has not progressed since I covered the Anita Hill hearings 27 years ago. Hmm. I mean, it, there is not a process in place. I think that's a huge problem. Diane Feinstein should have delivered that letter because now I think uh, Dr. Ford's story and account has been understandably politicized because of that failure. I think the way that some of the Republican members of the Senate Judiciary Committee handled this was, was, was very troubling. I thought Lindsey Graham's full-throated defense of Judge Kavanaugh was disturbing only that because it completely dismissed and discounted mm. Dr. Ford's uh, you know, story and personal experience. So mm. I think that we have a long way to go, and I'm very relieved that an FBI investigation or fact-finding mission has been called. It should have been called already. Jeff Flake mm. obviously had a crisis of conscience, and it will be interesting to see how he, Lisa Murkowski, and Susan Collins feel after we have a fair appraisal of what happened. Now, we'll, we, may we, never <laughs> we may never know the truth. That's right, and it's limited in scope. But I think everyone wants it to be fair mm. so that the full Senate can decide if Brett Kavanaugh has the character and the judicial temperament, if you will, mm. to have a lifelong position on the highest court in the land. And you're right, we may never know. And can someone evolve after bad behavior in high school and college? Or is that behavior so offensive and troubling? that it really disqualifies him. That Those are the things that the country and the Senate will be weighing. You've been known over the years for your big gets for TV bookings, and yet it's only Kavanaugh that's done a sit-down TV interview. None of his accusers have. Does, does that just tell us something about the media universe here? Well, I don't think so. I think that, that Judge Kavanaugh went to a friendly outlet, Fox News. Hard and questions, I think, though. You know, that's true, and I think it'll, it remains to be seen if some of the other accusers will, in fact, do television interviews. You're right, um, it hasn't been ruled out. Certainly this right, week I mean, can change things. There's yeah. still time, and I think mm. that uh, we might see some of them on television or in media outlets in the coming week. Yeah, speaking of the big get, this brings us to your podcast. It's been 10 years uh, since that famous Sarah Palin interview that you conducted while you were at CBS. Uh, and uh, you've, you've revisited it for your podcast by looking at how, how it changed the media world and also, frankly, how Palin led to Donald Trump. Yeah. Uh, let's look first at a clip uh, from the interview. This is one of the most, let's say, memorable questions and answers. What newspapers and magazines did you regularly read before you were tapped for this to stay informed and to understand the I've world? read most of them, again, with a great appreciation for the press, for the media. But like what coming, ones specifically? I'm curious that you... Um, all of them, any of them that um, have, have been in front of me over all these years unforgettable moment with, with Sarah Palin, and there were many in that interview. You say it was the most important interview you've ever done. Well, I think it was one of the most pivotal and mm. one of the most impactful, because as you remember, when that interview was done, it was the third interview that Governor Palin did. But I think it had a big repercussion, because I think people saw that she was out of her depth and could not answer public policy questions in a very uh, mm. satisfying or satisfactory way. You know, we really wanted to look at, through the lens of these interviews, the rise and fall of one of the most captivating candidates in recent memories, how she was selected. There's an interesting backstory, of course, about Joe Lieberman and how he came this close to being tapped. You know, all sorts of questions about how she was or really wasn't vetted. And, and, you know, uh, the role of the media in this, mm -hmm. now with social media, 10 years later, with disintermediation, the ability to go directly to consumers or voters, this sort of rite of passage of the network news interview with an anchor asking probing questions is no longer necessary mm -hmm. in the current media landscape. And so we wanted to look at that and how much things have changed and how her kind of anti-intellectual, 
uh, red meat populism, anti-media rhetoric, mm. did pave the way for Donald Trump and his anti-media uh, uh, sensibilities, right. if you will. And your critics and, said this was gotcha journalism. Was Did it make your brand well, more you know, polarizing? Because no, you, you know, were just asking a really simple question You know, question it's there. interesting. I think even Republicans thought all the questions I asked were exceedingly fair. And so I think it was after it sort of set in and Governor Palin knew that she had not performed well, that that became sort of the, the typical trope, that it was gotcha questions. But even, even Senator McCain, when I sat down with him for a joint interview, praised the interview I had done with Governor Palin. Mm. He had a very different campaign style, and obviously hers diverged from his. Right. Remember, he would calm down people who <laughs> right. said inappropriate things, yeah. and she seemed to egg them on and certainly not temper that. Very Trumpian. Yeah. Uh, and this was for CBS. Uh, you were at NBC at the, with Matt Lauer for years, then at CBS, uh, working at 60 Minutes with Jeff Fager, among many other people. Since we're at this one-year mark of the Me Too movement, can you share with us what you saw at those networks? Well, I think uh, I can talk specifically with Matt. Uh, he was a terrific professional partner f with me for many years. Uh, I was unaware of any kind of uh, this behavior, predatory behavior, and it was obviously very shocking and disturbing to me and a lot of his colleagues, Brian, as you well know. Yeah. Meanwhile, CBS News, I think it's clear from Ronan Farrow's excellent reporting that they have a real culture problem there. Mm -hmm. And the culture I found at 60 Minutes personally was very challenging and at times quite offensive because I think obsequious uh, subservience was a job requirement in order to thrive there for many women. What does that mean? Does that mean particular. suck up to the boss? Is Pretty that... much, yeah. Thank you for that translation. <laughs> and I think that, you know, obviously the male hierarchy has been in place there for years mm -hmm. and it's time for it to end. But they're not the only network that has a male hierarchy. If you look the, at the uh, news presidents at every major broadcast and cable network, they're all male. All three evening news anchors are male. The vast majority of executive producers at every network are male. And this really has to end. If we really believe that the tone at the top is paramount, then you have to have more diverse voices at the top because they have such an impact on the editorial choices that are made, who cover stories, and how they're covered. There's so a similarity a between uh, politics and media That's that I right. hear you describe. Yeah, and I about think our, you know, our industry has has to do hmm. much, much better. Furthermore, I think we also have to look at uh, this glass cliff. You know, when a woman is appointed or elevated, she has to be qualified and supported. Otherwise, if she doesn't succeed, all women are penalized for that. And finally, I think people need to understand implicit bias. You hmm. know, that's a, a relatively new area that needs to be understood better in media circles. These are con cultural conditioning that cause us to look at people a certain way. You know, I'm guilty of it too. I remember when Sarah Palin was picked, Brian, I said to Cindy McCain, how is she going to be vice president of the United States? She has ch all these children. Mm. She has a special needs child. And Cindy McCain looked at me like I had three heads. <laughs> and I realized she was right. I would never ask that question about a male candidate. So I think we have so much work to do. And I think, you know, if, if this is a fair analysis, investigation into the culture at CBS News by these outside law firms, and they're transparent and sincere in their desire to really change the culture, that will be a good thing. But I think mm -hmm. every network needs to do so. Interesting. Kay, thanks for being here. Yeah, Great good to, to see, see you. you.